Discord to the cloud. Um, so um, I had one quick announcement and then Helen's gonna in, in, uh, introduce our speaker, Bob Hagen today. Just a reminder that during the normal seminar, uh, during the formal seminar, we'll have everybody uh, muted. And um, if you have any questions that pop up to you in that time, you can send them through the chat and they'll come to the, the speaker and the co-host, Helen and I. Um, or uh, after you can just use your little raise hand thing, which I think is under uh, participants, I believe. Something like that. So raise your hand or just type something in the chat and Bob can call people. The one announcement that I had that we probably should have done last week is if anybody has any students or, or anyone in mind, there are still there is still time to submit for the KU Field Station Awards, um, which are due um, March 29th. Right, Helen, I think Monday. I was just gonna look that up. I don't remember, but it's yeah. soon. <laughs> I, I think it's March 29th at 5 p.m. and I'll put the link in the chat for anybody that uh, is interested in, in or has students that they think might be interested or, or just is interested in what's going on with KBS. Um, and after the formal seminar, we'll stop the recording and this will be posted on um, KBS's website in the next weeks. So with that, I will hand it over to Helen. Okay. Thank you, Bob, for coming. <laughs> well, it is my pleasure to introduce Bob Hagen from Environmental Studies. Um, I was just realizing that I've known Bob since the early 90s, I believe. <laughs> and uh, he's done lots of different things. Um, his original research, I believe, was on butterflies. He's done other insect community type work. But I think what's really impressive about Bob is all the time he has put into field courses at KU and a real champion of them. Uh, field courses are not easy to teach. <laughs> Weather and lots of other issues keep on uh, coming on. So I think the fact that he has taught these for so many years is something we all should really appreciate. And he's also been involved in a lot of uh, science education things just in general. Um, so with that, I think he can take off. We're going to hear today, I think, about uh, his interest in looking at deer and other animals with cameras. Let's see if I can do this here. Okay, we got that. This aside here. So um, as uh, Helen alluded, um, I am not a mammologist, um, but I try to uh, hang around with people who really do know about mammals and uh, absorb as much as I can. So with that, uh, I will uh, sort of say anything that uh, I get wrong is, is on me and the uh, points that I have correct are, are due entirely to uh, the support and uh, advice of friends and colleagues. Um, I should also say this talk was originally scheduled in February, and uh, some of you may know I had a, a health problem. Uh, basically, uh, uh, vertebrae were compressing my spine and causing, or spinal cord and causing problems. And I had originally sort of chalked that up to, um, you know, effects of old age. But as I was putting this talk together, it started to occur to me that uh, maybe it isn't just a coincidence that my own uh, vertebrae began attacking me as I was getting ready to talk about uh, other vertebrates. And so, um, you know, I'm not a conspiracy person, but um, you do have to wonder. And so um, I guess the next hour, be prepared to hear the, the shocking truth uh, about uh, mammals uh, and other animals uh, that are all around us. So with that, let's see if I can make this work. All right, I'm going to talk start briefly with an introduction sort of what we know about wild mammals at the KU field station, and then go in and talk about, or follow that with uh, three, uh, I guess, vignettes of projects that uh, I've been involved in. I'll spend most of the time on the first uh, one of these, which is the most uh, complicated long-term project. So let's see here. Um, as many of you know, uh, the KU Field Station has been the home of some very impressive long-term studies of small mammals. Uh, the longest running project was initiated by Norm Slade in 1973 and has been continued after Norm's retirement by Aaron Reed, uh, approaching now if, if, uh, its 50th year of study. Uh, another long-term project also focused on 
rodents was associated with habitat fragmentation experiment, which began in 1984 with Joe Foster's uh, thesis work and continued up until uh, 2002. There's been much less work, however, on the larger mammals at the KU field station. Uh, I didn't do a comprehensive search, but I could only find uh, four uh, publications focused on the larger mammals. Uh, work on coyotes in the 1950s by Henry Fitch, another study from the 70s that focused on raccoons, skunks, and opossums, uh, a study in 1962 uh, that discussed the state of deer in Kansas at a point where deer were emerging from near extinction. Uh, and uh, that was one of the first uh, project research projects done on deer in the, in the state. Uh, and then most recently, uh, an undergraduate RU student who worked with Norm Slade in the, in the early aughts. So really not a whole lot of work on the larger mammals. The uh, closest we have to that has been a, a now 12 year uh, collaboration with the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, uh, which is a spotlight deer survey. And we began that in 2008 with uh, Lloyd Fox, and it's continued uh, after Lloyd's retirement uh, with uh, Levi Jaster, uh, both of them the big game coordinators for the state of Kansas. And as part of that survey, students in the field ecology class uh, participate in that. And the goal is to get an estimate of the deer densities in and around the field station. I talked a few years ago about the methodology for uh, uh, more about this work. Uh, so I won't go into it in detail. Uh, basically, as the name implies, uh, we drive around at night on the back of a uh, uh, modified pickup truck with powerful spotlights. And when we spy or when deer are spotted, we record information on their distance and location. Uh, and that survey is conducted over three nights each year in late October. And the goal again is to get an estimate of the density of deer. This is uh, the routes we follow are kind of a standardized track. Here's the sort of the, the heart of the field station headquarters there. And our routes sort of circle and then go into the, the field station here. And this is kind of another graph of that. Um, in theory, this really shouldn't work at all. It's, it's a methodology that was designed to develop for working with marine mammals um, and kind of imply, requires that your uh, target animals kind of are freely roaming wherever they want to go. And uh, we tend to think of deer as somewhat intelligent, but in some ways they behave a little more like, uh, like gas molecules, I think, in terms of where they are. The survey at the KU field station here is one of a whole series of similar surveys that wildlife and parks biologists conduct each fall. The purpose is to get information on populations of deer throughout the state. And that information is then used to uh, set hunting limits and seasons uh, and basically to guide management uh, decisions. So the KU field station is one of a large series of these. Uh, the closest survey to us is uh, conducted at the Clinton Wildlife Area. And these are the kind of a summary of the results of this uh, 12 years we've been doing that. The uh, black squares are the KU field station numbers and the open circles are the Clinton Wildlife Areas. Numbers, you can see a consistent difference, the field station with the exception of a few years between 2011 and uh, 2015 uh, has consistently had higher densities than the wildlife area. And you now that's perfectly understandable. The field station is not, uh, uh, hunting isn't permitted there. Some of the neighbors, uh, neighboring landowners do hunt deer, but many don't. Um, so basically, the deer populations are largely unregulated. In contrast, the wildlife area is managed for deer. 
So uh, densities there are, are kept in, intact. Um, and uh, this number here, which looks like it may be going up at the wildlife area, uh, Levi Jaster, who sent me these results, indicated there may, be, may have been a data analysis problem with that. So it's not clear that, that those numbers are also uh, higher in 2020 than they were in the previous year. Um, if you ask, I can talk later about what happened sort of in the, the mid-teens uh, with the deer. But nonetheless, this difference in densities, uh, particularly as it was occurring sort of prior to 2011, um, really initiated a lot of concern about the ecological effects of those high numbers. I mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, deer, or I, in the previous talk anyway, about the fact that deer were hunted nearly to extinction in the state uh, by the mid part, early part of the 20th century. And beginning in the 1960s, uh, numbers came up to what is now historically probably unprecedented uh, in terms of the densities. So we can ask what are the effects of white-tailed deer on tree seedling growth, basically on forest regeneration. So um, to sort of illustrate the, uh, the sort of motivation for that, um, these are a couple of photographs from the field station, uh, forested area not far from the headquarters. What you can see is particularly apparent in the, in the uh, springtime, a very clear browse line where it looks like somebody has gone along with shears and basically trimmed off the shrubby vegetation. Those shears, of course, are, are the, the teeth of deer. If you look more closely at individual seedlings within that area, you find abundant evidence for uh, uh, repeated damage to, sh to shoots. The deer are browsers. So particularly when the young shoots are, uh, are just starting out, the deer wander by and, and take bites off the, off the growing tips. And uh, this has obvious and potentially very serious implications for the uh, uh, manage for the uh, maintenance of the forest, for recruitment into the into the canopy layer, uh, and other other consequences. And so, beginning in about 2012, we conducted a, a pilot study to um, uh, see if we could get some information from exposures. Um, and in 2018. Uh, we set out to um, do a more uh, comprehensive uh, study of the deer effects. Um, so we set out plots at the Clinton Wildlife Area. These are the biologists who manage that. Uh, students here at KU were uh, instrumental in constructing exposure and control plots um, at the KU Field Station. Uh, and we did that in fall of 2018. The completed exposures look like this. They're 16 feet on a side, uh, made out of um, uh, cattle fencing, about six feet tall. Deer would have no problem whatsoever hopping over a fence like that, but because they're small size, we um, figured the deer would rather walk around it than, than hop inside. And we confirmed that in the pilot study and then uh, in a preliminary, in the first year of work on this larger study, the deer basically just walk around the fences. Uh, next to each of these um, 16 by 16 foot fenced exposures, there is an unfenced control plot. So as I mentioned, um, we have sets of exclosures and control plots at the Clinton Wildlife Area and at the KU Field Station. And if you recall from the uh, spotlight survey densities, higher deer densities here than uh, in the wildlife area there. The design of this experiment consists of the sites where there's a fenced exclosure plot and then 
10 meters away or so. There's an unfenced exclosure plot here. Here's one of the uh, corner posts. It's the same deer, um, two different views of the same animal. So those two plots are located close to each other. And then at about 50 to 100 meters away, there's another pair of exposure and control plots. And then we have three sets of those here is that first one and then two others at the field station. And the same spatial arrangement at the Clinton Wildlife Area, because the wildlife area is a, you know, not a, a compact a landscape and much more um, uh, spread out of, uh, because of the Wakarusa Valley, those sites are spread out a little, little further apart. But again, here are the, the three pairs of um, paired sites. <laughs> right. So once we set up the exclosures, um, I, uh, and with, with the help of students, uh, found 10 naturally growing seedlings in each of the plots. So we located those measured them and tagged them, uh, 10 naturally growing seedlings. The advantage of the naturally growing seedlings is that they're already established in there. So we don't have to worry about watering them or um, sort of planting mortality. The disadvantage of course, is that they're going to be whatever species happen to be in the plot. So there are some differences uh, between the KU field station uh, mix of natural species and the wildlife area species. Um, and we can go into possible reasons for that. Um, I will say that uh, when I selected those natural seedlings, I avoided species such as um, red bud and uh, white ash that our uh, pre preliminary studies had indicated deer really don't care for. So these are all species that, uh, tree species that the deer are, uh, shall we say, interested in browsing. In addition to the 10 natural seedlings, I purchased um, some uh, bare root uh, shell bark hickory seedlings from the Kansas Forestry Department and planted 10 of those in each of the plots. These uh, shell bark hickories um, are uh, right here. So we have a total of then 20 seedlings that we're monitoring for growth and survival in the exclosure and the unprotected control plots. And so as I mentioned, we were interested in trying to see whether the fate of those seedlings is related to the activity of deer. And therefore, as part of the project, we've set up an array of motion activated cameras called camera traps. Uh, and we do this in late winter and early spring of the year. Our first set was in the uh, spring of 2019 and then in 2020. Uh, because of my health problems, I wasn't able to uh, get cameras set out uh, this spring. Um, and uh, Olivia Childress was an undergraduate uh, working with me uh, on her environmental studies honors uh, project. Uh, was really the, the central figure in both establishing the exposures and uh, the initial work with the, the first year of the cameras. Uh, work in 2020 was continued by two other undergraduates, Sierra Wadud and Sierra, Sarah Milgram, who were shown here helping me. So this particular camera is focused on the plot. You can see one of the corner stakes here, the opposite one here. So this whole area is uh, where we're focused on deer. Work that Olivia had done in 2019 uh, showed, uh, gave us confidence that the deer are not going inside the exclosures. So for the 2020 cameras, we just focused on uh, the control plots. So this is sort of what the deer are doing. A pair of, uh, does, I believe, hard to say, wandering through the, uh, through one of the control plots. 
And here is sort of the control plot, and you can see the fenced exclosure uh, next door to it. So these are the results after two years. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea of what happens, this is a shell bark hickory in an unfenced control plot. And this is one of the shell bark hickories in the adjacent fenced exclosure plot. That's there. And what we find out is that the mean seedling growth after two years, very similar in at both the Clinton Wildlife Area and KU Field Station, an average of uh, 17 centimeters in height growth over two years. Um, but a striking difference, of course, in the unprotected, uh, in the seedlings in the unprotected control plots. And that difference much greater at the KU field station. Um, these uh, uh, data are basic, are just from the natural uh, tree seedlings. The planted shell bark hickories uh, are, I think, we're spending their first couple of years really getting their root systems established. So not a lot of, um, of, uh, of height growth uh, and indeed a certain amount of mortality. So, the analysis here is really just with the, the natural seedlings. But it, it's quite remarkable that we're seeing this effect after only two years. The plan is to have the project continue for at least two more years, which our preliminary study suggested is both long enough to see something and about as long as the exposures can last before trees fall on them and, and other uh, sort of maintenance issues show up. If we look more closely at variation among sites, we see substantial difference. So this top panel set of panels are at the Clinton Wildlife Area and the bottom panels are at the KU Field Station. And what we find out is see is quite clearly a much less variation in the growth at the field station uh, than at the wildlife area. And um, also substantial what looks like heterogeneity among the sites. And so one of the obvious questions and part of the research plan is, is, is that variation among sites caused by differences in the deer activity? We might expect that in places where deer are more active, you can imagine that perhaps this site, that's having a very severe effect on the unprotected seedlings, whereas areas where deers are, deer are not as active much less difference. So these are data that uh, basically I just got on Wednesday. So I really haven't had more than uh, 48 hours to really uh, digest them. These are based on about 16,000 images from 12 cameras that were deployed for 36 days in uh, March and April of 2020. What this uh, histogram shows is the detection rate, that is the mean number of deer visits per day at the Clinton Wildlife Area here on the left and the KU Field Station. Uh, and what we can see, and it's kind of gratifying to see that, is that in fact, yes, there is a difference in deer activity as measured by uh, this detection rate uh, between these two areas, which is consistent with the spotlight survey uh, results. Uh, what we see, however, is that the variation among sites doesn't directly correlate with the, the seedling responses. Um, this left set is uh, based on the detection rate. We can use those camera data to um, look at other measures, for example, how much time the deer are spending at each uh, site in front of the cameras. So this here is the mean number of seconds per day that the deer are present. And you notice some differences among the sites that don't align entirely well. For example, KU site one had a fair number of visits, but um, much less time as though the deer at that site may be passing through rather than hanging around. In contrast, site uh, KU3, uh, both lots of deer visiting 
and lots of time spent there. So um, I can say there, you know, you know, results are sort of in process here. Uh, at least uh, three possible things are going on. One is that there may be variation from year to year. Uh, Olivia's work in 2019 uh, with cameras suggested that KU Site 2 was by far the most popular site with deer uh, in 20, 2019, much somewhat less so in 2020. Um, I haven't worked up those data yet because the cameras were using a different setup and uh, it requires a little extra work. But we have additional uh, uh, you know, year to look at and we're going to continue, I'm going to continue this project for at least another two years. So we'll see how these patterns uh, play out over that longer period of time. The second possibility is that these average measures may not be capturing the most important um, features of what the deer are doing. It may not be sort of deer walking through that are the primary indicators. It may be those events in which an individual deer or a small herd spend a large amount of time chomping on things. So those less frequent events may be the, the real uh, critical factor. Uh, finally, of course, it's possible that there really is no relationship. Although, again, the difference between the areas, the consistent difference between Clinton Wildlife Area and KU Field Station, and the corresponding difference in the seedlings that are uh, difference in seedling growth between protected and unprotected, suggests that the deer are doing something, and uh, we can hope to catch that. So, uh, in addition to Deer, of course, the cameras are capturing uh, evidence of lots of other animals. Um, and one of the challenges in working with it, I mentioned that this table is based on 16,000 images. Um, almost half of those are, um, shall we say, uninteresting from the standpoint of uh, wildlife. 42% uh, of them of the camera were triggered by waving vegetation another 5% by us when we were working on the plots or when um, uh, people wandered by. Um, so but even so excluding those events, we had 998 uh, animals, uh, uh, wand wild animals uh, walking through or walking into the camera areas at both the wildlife area and field station the majority of those were white-tailed deer, 65%. But in addition, we had uh, eastern fox squirrels, uh, Virginia possum, some gray squirrels at the uh, KU field station, particularly one area, uh, raccoons and occasional coyote. And in addition, uh, turkey and uh, uh, other, other birds. Um, what's kind of, the cameras are really optimized for um, detecting large mammals. So these other visit uh, detections are somewhat um, less uh, likely to capture all of the activity. But nonetheless, you can get an idea of some of the sort of non-mammals that are also shown. Uh, wild turkeys uh, made their appearance. A nice shot of a red-headed uh, woodpecker. Uh, in addition, at one area, a barred owl uh, decided to use that uh, exposure plot as a, as a hunting ground. In a nice sequence of this, probably the same individual, uh, uh, I don't know if it was successful, but definitely uh, striking after something on the ground. And then, because I'm not a vertebrate biologist, I was also happy to see um, some insects. It's a question mark butterfly. Um, the butterfly did not trigger the motion sensor. It was a wind, uh, wind event, but the butterfly happened to be flying past and a wasp <laughs> crawling on the camera. So I wanna take a brief sort of side track for those who might be thinking about sort of doing this kind of work uh, and also to kind of convey how we go from 16,000 camera images to uh, tables that we can actually make sense. 
And uh, when I began working with cameras uh, in 2015, we quickly discovered that working with the data was the biggest barrier to that. And uh, in uh, 2019, uh, I found out about the eNAML project out of the Smithsonian Institution, which really has revolutionized our ability to work with camera data. So a couple of little bits of terminology. Camera trap is simply a camera set out to take images uh, when the sensor detects motion. A deployment is a period in which that camera is in place. And then a sequence is a series of images that represent a single event when the camera trap is triggered. So uh, in eMAML, images that are separated by no more than one minute from the previous image are grouped as a sequence within the deployment. So that enables us to get an idea of how long the animals were present in that area. So once you fire up the uh, eMAML um, desktop, you're presented with sort of various sort of deployment screens to get it started. And then the heart of the, the desktop is this, um, uh, the desktop app is this, um, I guess, tool for working with and identifying the sequences. So the, the server, the program, groups the images into sets of these sequences. So for example, in this first sequence, there are three images and the tool allows you to scroll through those images and using a drop-down list, identify what was responsible for triggering us. In this case, presumably because that animal wasn't clearly in the frame, they recognized it as an unknown animal. So you chunk through all of the sequences. In the case of the exposure results, there were 1,500 or about, there's about a bit between about one and 200, one and 300 image uh, sequences from each of the cameras for a total of 1,500 sequences. Once you've identified all the sequences, those get uploaded to the Smithsonian uh, servers or the servers that uh, are accessed through the Smithsonian uh, website. And then uh, they are sort of deposited in a, a waiting area, the um, expert review tool, it's called, which is a chance for you to kind of second guess your identification. That armadillo I was convinced was present, uh, you get a chance to look at it again and realize it really was just, it was most likely just another uh, possum. Um, I did the review for the, the uh, wildlife uh, exposure uh, experiment for the snapshot project that I'll talk in a moment, reviewers consisted of uh, a variety of other folks from around the country. So again, second opinions. The way this all fits together is that here we are sort of creating data, setting out our camera traps, using the desktop app, uploading that to the servers, the expert ID, that then gets transferred to um, the repository, so all of those identified sequences and images are now available and archived along with the extracted summary data, which we can then access through the website. Um, this is, you know, while we're working on it, it's sort of, you know, we, we keep it to ourselves, but after a period of time that one sets up in the project, it becomes then available to, the, to uh, other researchers and the general public. Uh, this is the system sort of as, as it is currently, but sometime perhaps later this year, the eMAML website and, and archive is going to be integrated with uh, an international uh, repository, Eyes on Wildlife, and really provide a global archive of uh, this kind of imaged resources. So I mentioned a little bit about the Snapshot project. I won't say much about it, both because of time and because um, the uh, paper describing the first year of it is still in press in ecology. Um, this is the list of authors. <laughs> it's a survey of national mammals. There were camera trap arrays set up in all 50 states. Um, and uh, we set up uh, the first year in 2019, first year of the study in 2019, 
12 camera sites that were selected by students in the field ecology class, six of them kind of in grassland areas and six of them in uh, sort of woodland edge habitats. Um, I added uh, two more camera sites in 2020 because it turns out to be easier to have more cameras than have cameras out for longer. Uh, these are the students sort of checking the cameras and uh, being immortalized in the, in the camera images. Uh, so because the paper is still in press um, and I don't have a whole lot to say about the results there, um, but uh, Roland Case, who was uh, at, in North Carolina State University and one of the principal investigators on this, uh, did generate this kind of uh, fun little tool, sort of comparing all of the sites for the number of mammals they had. Uh, you are here in this one. We're not terribly mammal rich. The most mammal detections was uh, in 2019 was a site in uh, Illinois around Champaign-Urbana. Um, it turns out the armadillo uh, headquarters for the US is Pittsburgh, Kansas, right here. Uh, we didn't have a single armadillo in, in our detections. Um, uh, these data were used um, sort of pre-publication uh, by students, uh, both in my field ecology class and uh, around the country and other universities uh, on a variety of projects uh, last fall. Uh, students in my class <clears throat> did a comparison of the Pittsburgh, Kansas um, camera trap data with what we were finding at the field station, essentially a comparison of a, of a somewhat more urban setting with a more rural setting. Uh, another group of students uh, worked with data that had been collected by camera traps deployed in Southeast Alaska and were focused on activity patterns of uh, uh, brown bear, grizzly bears in the forest. And still others looking at activity patterns, daily activity patterns of deer in different, different areas. So it's an extraordinarily rich data set that will become only more valuable as it continues uh, for uh, future years. So I want to turn here in, in the last bit, talk a little bit about um, sort of a little fun project, which I uh, began last fall, uh, basically to have a chance for students in the field ecology class to do a little more with uh, wildlife camera traps. Uh, so what we did was to set out nine cameras uh, in the woods just up the slope from uh, the main West Campus area. There's the Gucci Hall and KBS to orient you. And so this is an area here. It's a fascinating uh, little patch of uh, second growth woodland that's developed um, basically once agriculture ceased sometime in the 19, mid part of the 20th century. Um, so we set out the cameras. We put them out only for one week. Um, so it's a very short interval. Um, and this is sort of what uh, came out of that. This is the West Campus yield. Uh, so a total of 139 um, animals uh, during that week. Not surprising, the majority of those white-tailed deer, Eastern gray squirrel, fair number of, of humans uh, wandering by. And since this is an area that's sort of accessible to people, getting an idea of human activity there is also potentially of interest but a variety of other animals uh, that showed up, including bobcat. Um, and sort of as an exercise for the students, I pulled out data from uh, one week in September, 2019 from the snapshot uh, USA data set. So this is uh, what the pictures looked like for um, nine cameras at the field station in a comparable sort of spatial array. And uh, quite to our surprise, I suppose, retrospect not, both fewer individual uh, showing up in the cameras uh, and much less diversity, heavy abundance of white-tailed deer again, but far fewer other animals. Um, we can discuss why it is that that area might have 
uh, less diversity and abundance than West Campus, but it is quite interesting uh, to see that. And here's some of the sort of more charismatic animals that have shown up. This is the sequence with the West Campus bobcat uh, visiting the camera area. Uh, coyote were, were moderately common at both the KU Field Station in the West Campus and also in Clinton Wildlife Area. This very handsome animal decided to pose for us in the morning. And I haven't don't know whether the 2020 expert review, you know, agrees with me, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we actually got a picture of a field station bobcat uh, resident. Um, no sign of uh, mountain lions in, in any of our camera trap results so far, but that doesn't surprise me too much. Uh, any mountain lions this area are, are going to be, you know, wandering individuals and much less uh, much less readily uh, detected. So really the next steps for, for this project or these sets of projects are again to continue two more years of the exposure experiment that should allow us really to, to quantify how much effect uh, uh, deer are having on uh, tree growth and by extension uh, forest uh, succession and regeneration. Uh, we're going to continue participating in the Snapshot USA project, and I hope uh, to get some of the, you know, someone else to continue that after I uh, step aside from all of this, because I think it is a really valuable project. Again, as a nation nationwide uh, uh, picture of the of the wild mammal, uh, wild mammals of the continent. Uh, and then additionally, I think we'd like to continue working in the West Campus woods, both to get a better handle on the resident animals and understand their behavior and uh, distribution. And of course, I'm still looking for that elusive armadillo. Um, I know they're out there. This, this handsome fellow wandered across uh, when they were out checking cameras back in 2019. So uh, with that, Got a whole bunch of people to thank. Um, Levi Jaster and Lloyd Fox with Wildlife and Parks, really been my teachers about deer. Uh, Roland Kays and Mike Cove and the eMammal team uh, really made a lot of the analysis possible. We're just beginning to really get started with, with that level of analysis. At Clinton Wildlife Area, Justin Hamilton, Scott Purden, and Ethan Chadick have been kind of incredibly helpful. Uh, with all of the work and with the spotlight surveys. As always, Bruce, Vaughn, and Sheena at the field station are, are absolutely essential, <laughs> essential anything we do there. Finally, just a whole raft of undergraduates have been critical to the success of this. So I mentioned Olivia Childress, uh, graduated in 2019, really did the initial work. Uh, Sarah Milgram, Sarah Wadud, Logan Hagen McEnany, Hannah Newest and Sydney Becker, as well as others, helped me in 2019-20. And then uh, huge numbers of undergraduate students. Uh, if we consider the spotlight surveys going back uh, you know, a dozen years. And again, Wildlife and Parks supported that, Environmental Studies, Field Station, and uh, a special shout out to the uh, research scholarships available through the Environmental Studies. And finally, since she's not here to be embarrassed, uh, I have to thank Deb Smith, who has made all of this possible and put up with um, lots of late dinners and uh, me, uh, you know, basically shirking things I should do. So thanks, Deb. So with that, any questions? And I'll kind of uh, turn this back to... Um, Anyone else? Excellent. Thank you, Bob. I'm going to stop the recording here.